and welcome to the Financial Wake Up Show. Each week, we explore and take a deep dive into awakening the financial abundance we all have inside of us. We educate and create awareness by focusing on fundamental principles of money, talking to business and community leaders about successful habits, while learning from each other how to build, protect, and create legacies. And now, here's your host, Daniel Choi. Good morning. It's a new day. It's a Memorial Day weekend holiday. And uh, with each day comes a new beginning, a new chance to do something great, learn something new, and enjoy everything this great life has to offer. Thank you for joining me here on the Financial Wake Up Show. If you have not already done so, go to iTunes or Google Play, subscribe to the podcast. You can download all our shows there. Also, subscribe to the show on YouTube. You can find all of this under the Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Choi. I want to give a quick shout out to some listeners in Texas. A new state has come up on the listenership statistics. So, welcome, Texas, to the show. Uh, broadcasting here again on KCAA Radio, the station that leaves no listener behind. Uh, I combine integrity with intelligence to wake you up to things you want to be doing financially. Check out our website, financialwakeupshow.com, or visit us on Facebook and Twitter. That's at TFWUS. If you have any doubt, just reach out. On each show, every week, we talk about three things. Number one, growing and protecting your wealth. Number two, exit planning, which is selling or transferring your business if you're a business owner or retirement if you're an employee. And finally, estate planning, which is creating a legacy while fully enjoying your money while you're alive. And uh, as we go into this three-day weekend, uh, something's been on my mind that I want to talk about, which is... There are certain things in in life uh, that we take for granted. I think it's part of human nature to assume things go the way they're supposed to. Uh, And when something doesn't happen the way we think, of course, it's a big shock. And one of the things I've learned in working with many different families, business owners, executives, uh, nothing in life is guaranteed. And I'm going to talk today about some of the things that we assume may go the way they're supposed to. But historically, when things arise, my big question is, are you prepared? Or at least are you aware? You see, because, uh, you know, there have been horrible plane crashes that we hear about and people, you know, pass away in these horrible accidents. That doesn't stop us from flying. Uh, I've been in a few car accidents in my life. Thankfully, nothing serious, but that doesn't stop me from getting in my car and driving away. And there are financial events that have occurred. Uh, That doesn't mean we should just give up on the system altogether. It's similar to anything in life. There's no guarantees. At the same time, I do think it's important to be aware, to wake up to some of the things that have occurred and can occur so that you're prepared about these things. And so today's Wake Up Now segment is, what are some things that we might take for granted that we may think are guaranteed to be there that may not be there? And uh, how should we approach and think about these types of events? And I'm gonna talk about two particular types of events that we may take for granted. The first is our banking system. Many of you listeners who've been with me for a while know I'm big on savings. I did an entire show on why savings rate is so much more powerful than your rate of return on your investments and how if you look at the truly successful, financially at least, people in the world, they have cash. They have cash to take advantage of discounts and sales on investments, on real estate. They look for opportunity and they capitalize. And those who don't have a lot of savings, who don't leave a lot available in liquid forms, aren't able to capitalize the same way. They can't buy into businesses when uh, there's an opportunity. Um, They just don't get the same delta or difference from buying in at a lower price point and riding the wave up. And so banking systems are incredibly important when you think about where you're going to put cash. And the first sort of thing we take for granted is that the banking system's always going to be there. Uh, In fact, my guest today is going to talk a lot about 
uh, solvency of banks and what he's done in his uh, amazing career to fix some of those problems. But I'm going to talk about what's called a bank run or also known as a run on the bank. Uh, this occurred most recently, just about 10 years ago, less than 10 years ago, with the financial crash crash of 2007-2008. And uh, a lot of people remember the stock market crashing, uh, but some of you may also, if you think back in your memory banks, uh, will recall that banks had severe, severe issues during these times. In fact, it's one of the few financial crises that were caused by financial institutions. And I want to talk about what exactly happened and what you should be aware of. So what is a bank run? It's when a bank keeps a small proportion of their assets in cash and then a large number of customers, typically the bigger ones, starts to withdraw this cash quickly at the same time or in a short period of time because they think that bank or financial institution might become insolvent. They transfer the cash into other investments like government bonds or other things that they think are secure. And all of a sudden, the bank's in trouble. Now, I started the show by saying I'm a big proponent of keeping cash on your balance sheet as individuals, as families. Well, banks need to do the same because a bank and a company is analogous to your situation. You're just an individual. And I've said this before, I advise people to treat their finances as if they were a corporation. But so many times people don't. And so when you have banks that keep a low ratio of assets and cash and big clients take their money out and transfer it or put it into something else because they're worried about something, that's called a bank run. And if they transfer the money to another company, that's known as what's called a capital flight. The, the capital's leaving. Now, here's the worst part about a bank run, is that momentum starts to build. Once one customer does it, the next thing you know, another customer, another company, another institution does it, and all of a sudden you get this really fast spiral downwards, and a number of events start to trigger. It can destabilize a bank to the point where it runs out of cash, and all of a sudden it faces bankruptcy. And so there are ways to combat this, but it's happened. In fact, it can lead to what's called a banking panic, where a bunch of banks start to face runs at the same time. And now you have a snowball, and we saw this in 2007, 2008. And the next thing you know, the market crashes, we lose a tremendous amount of value in our investments, uh, and we have a problem. If you go back to 1930 in the Great Depression, that was a systemic issue with the banks. Similar situation where we had massive, massive uh, losses uh, due to a systemic banking crisis. And, you know, the Great Depression to this day remains the biggest financial uh, issue we've ever run into as a country. Now, there are ways to prevent these bank runs, as I mentioned earlier. But before I go into that, I want to give you some history of the events that happened in 2007, 2008, 2009. It started on March 11th, and a bank run occurred on, a, on an investment company, a banking company called Bear Stearns. So everyone's like, oh, I know Bear Stearns, of course. Well, it is a securities and banking firm. So it's not like a Chase Bank or a Wells Fargo. It's an investment and banking firm. Not a normal deposit-taking bank, but it financed some long-term investments and it made it very vulnerable to this type of panic. And as soon as uh, they became at risk to make their obligations, so again, I told you earlier, you can't take for granted a guarantee. Uh, within two days, Bear Stearns' capital base went from $17 billion to $2 billion in two days. So remember I termed that a capital flight? That's a massive capital flight. It, the capital base dwindled $15 billion in two days. So the government says, uh-oh, we can't let this happen because the rest of our system is going to shut down. So by Friday of that week, so 11th of March was a Tuesday, so in three days, Federal Reserve decides to lend money to Bear Stearns. And that was the first time since the Great Depression that a bank received government help. Stocks sank. Everyone starts panicking. And then finally, J.P. Morgan came in and bought Bear Stearns uh, 
by that weekend to calm the fears. Well, remember I said things start to toilet bowl and spiral downwards. Uh, on July 11th, IndyMac Bank was seized by federal re regulators. And this is because uh, they were a the largest mortgage lender in the United States at the time. And if you don't remember, really the, 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 the light, the, the match that lit this whole fire was bad mortgages, the paper loans. And I'm sure you've heard stories of that where people just stated their incomes and got a loan and, and mortgages were given out. What happens to that mortgage? Well, big, big firms buy those mortgages, put them together in packages, kind of like mutual funds, except they're mortgages. They collateralize them, and all of a sudden, you get a bunch of bad mortgages. You have bad debt on your hands, and that guarantee to pay isn't so strong anymore. So we took it for granted. Next thing you know, the poor quality of those investments gets exposed, uh, and then the next thing you know, in IndyMac goes under. Uh, the losses were over two hundred seventy million dollars. Uh, then in September. The government, uh, the Office of Thrift Supervision, shuts down Washington Mutual, which was the largest savings and loan in the United States. At the time, it was the sixth biggest financial institution. Another big, massive run caused this. In the 10 days leading up to the shutdown of Washington Mutual, customers withdrew $16.7 billion in deposits. Now, a lot of times, banks are seized on a Friday, but this was so big, they, they just did it in the middle of the week. And then later, that next day, the 26th of September, Wachovia, which was at the time the fourth largest bank, lost $5 billion in deposits. Uh, and because of what happened the day before with Washington Mutual, Wachovia ended up being taken over by Wells Fargo. So what does this mean for you? And if some of you may recall in the news, people lining up around IndyMac Bank at the time to get their money out because they're wondering, where's my cash? Where's, where's my savings? And um, could this happen again? Well, historically it has, so sure it could happen again. So what are some ways that banks prevent this? And again, this is just to keep you aware. They might limit the amount that you can withdraw at one time. The Federal Reserve has set what's called a reserve limit. In, in, in other words, a mandatory cash reserve for financial institutions. Um, and some of this regulation came in after the Great Depression. Definitely more regulation has come in after 2008 because we don't want to see this type of thing happen. And when our financial institutions degrade to the point that they did because of these mortgage obligations, um, our whole financial infrastructure is shocked. And you see a big, big, uh, what, what we call the great, great recession that happened right after that. Now, as consumers, you have to understand that there are some protections that you have. And uh, again, one of the topics we talk about is growing and protecting your wealth every single week. Uh, many of you heard of the FDIC and the SIPC. In fact, you go to most financial companies in their lobbies, you will see a sign that says FDIC and SIPC. Do you know what those are? And again, this show is designed to wake you up. So let me tell you what they are. FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. It's an independent agency of the US. It is backed by the credit of the United States government. Okay, it was established after the Great Depression and it covers deposits, including checking, savings accounts, money market accounts, CDs, these are essentially fixed investments that fluctuate to the interest rate. It does provide $250,000 of coverage per depositor. Now, as of about 2012, there are roughly $9 billion in, uh, in accounts across the United States. I'm sorry, $9 trillion in accounts that uh, were set aside for FDIC coverage, the government had only allotted $3 trillion. So even with the FDIC in place, if there was a major systemic failure, there's not enough insurance there to cover the amount of total deposits. That's something you got to keep in mind. Now, the SIPC was created under the SIPA, which is the Securities Investor Protection Act. 
and that's a nonprofit corporation designed to protect investors when the broker dealer or the financial institution they're working with is in financial trouble like Bear Stearns was. And what this provides is it expedites within certain limits the return of your property, which is investments in cash, up to $500,000, of which $250,000 is limited to cash. So if you have stocks, bonds, mutual funds, uh, you have additional protection. Now, with that in mind, for all of this to go down the tube, although we've had runs on banks, we've recovered. In fact, since 2008, we've seen a pretty remarkable run in our economy, which has continued through today. Things would have to get about 10 times worse than it did in 2007, 2008. And that's because the full faith and credit of the U.S. government, which backs these organizations, would have to crumble. So putting that all together, is there something to worry about? And a couple weeks ago, I talked about gold and silver and keeping things in precious metals. And if you want to do that, you know, if you if if we really ran into that situation, I don't think worrying about uh, our gold bullion will be our biggest problem. It'll probably be some type of uh, governmental major collapse, which means the foundation of our entire country would be shaken and uh, you know, I've seen a comp, uh, zombie apocalypse shows and things like that. You know, I think our bigger concern would be our personal safety at that point. Because for the infrastructure of our government to fail, um, I can't really imagine it. But I can't say that we shouldn't be aware of what's going on and what you're protected with. Which also means that the FDIC and the SIPC that offer you some protection, it's good to know this stuff and I want you to be aware of it, particularly because I think savings is so important. The other thing to watch out for and the second thing that I want you to be aware of is guarantees offered by companies, namely insurance companies. Many people have insurance policies and they say, well, Dan, I, I got a great deal from this insurance company and uh, it's, it's a low premium and you know, there have been stories in the last several years where insurance companies have delayed or denied claims for every kind of insurance you can imagine. Health, life, you name it. Any type of claim you're trying to make. I have seen personally clients where unfortunately a family member dies and through delays and medical records and everything, the life insurance doesn't pay out for 18 months. Sometimes never paid out. In fact, there are huge hundred million dollar settlements in the last three years against some major major insurers that have been around for over a hundred years so another thing to not take for granted is guarantees because a guarantee is only as good as who's guaranteeing the money so it's important to always work with client uh, companies excuse me that have high credit ratings with organizations that have sound financial balance sheets and my question to you is how much in depth have you looked into that? Or are you simply relying on the word of somebody uh, that you're listening to on the side? The, so the be aware of be, beware tip of the week is be aware that this stuff can happen. It's happened in the past. It doesn't mean that we're not going to use the banking systems and the financial institutions. Just like if you were to get into a car accident and you're hopefully okay after that that you're going to drive again. You know, it, these things can occur though. And I see an overall lack of awareness around this. So be aware of the protections you have in place. Be aware of the credit worthiness of the firms that are offering you guarantees. Don't take this for granted or beware. Uh, if a major collapse or financial situation happens, you could end up in a situation that you don't want to be in. Uh, you could have something that you are relying on, like a health insurance benefit. Long-term care is a nightmare in certain situations to receive benefits on those. Um, life insurance as well. If you're depending on these things, who's guaranteeing the money? Be aware of this. Okay. So when we get back, we're going to continue this discussion on banking with our first guest. And I was able to do this interview live uh, in their uh, offices, which was a lot of fun. But before we do that, we're going to take a quick break 
Before I go to break, reminder, if you have any doubt, just reach out. Daniel at FinancialWakeUpShow.com. Call me if you want, 8507-WAKE-UP, 8507-WAKE-UP. We can chat more about this. But uh, we got to hear a word from our sponsors. You're listening to the Financial Wake Up Show with Daniel Choi on KCAA, 1050 AM, 106.5 FM. We'll be right back. I want to talk for a quick second about a unique internship program. I think a great internship program gives you a chance to make a name for yourself while picking up specialized skills that can launch your career. And if you can do that in a niche industry with a high level of importance that impacts how businesses operate, well then that's a win-win-win scenario. So I'm going to talk to you about Core Support Systems, a company that has an internship program for you listeners who want to get a foot in the door of a very important industry. For over 20 years, Core Support Systems has provided equipment for what are called mission-critical environments. They handle power requirements in case the power goes out. In fact, I'm learning we take power for granted. We need it for everything, and we don't realize the, the crucial issues that happen if power goes out. So think about it. Who uses this? Hospitals. You can't have power go out during surgeries. How about computer server farms, these huge warehouses? You can't have power going out. Uh, or the internet shuts down. This is big, big stuff we rely on. And Core Support Systems delivers uninterruptible power supplies to these huge operations that need this in case of any mission critical or outage situation. They also do centralized emergency lighting. They do design and assessment of your power distribution needs. They do precision cooling for all your businesses as well. They install and support these systems. I know the owners there, Hector and Irene, they are fantastic. They have a great team and have built an unbelievable business. They are looking for a business development intern who will help secure contracts for key accounts. You'll be expected to learn about product and service offerings, which will add to your ability to increase sales revenues and your personal business income. Core Support Systems is moving forward to a virtual office, so you're going to be primarily working from home, and how can you beat that? Uh, occasionally, you'll have to go to the corporate office. But you do need a high level of computer literacy, especially with uh, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint being some of the key softwares you need to know. Uh, but if you're goal-oriented, customer-oriented, you're reliable, you've got a positive attitude, a great attendance record, and you're a team player, take a look at the internship being offered at Core Support Systems. It's a great opportunity to launch your career within a niche market and have some fantastic upside potential. For inquiries, email ialvarado at coresupportsys.com. That's ialvarado at coresupportsys.com, or you can call them toll-free, 800-780-2673, extension 4453. Again, the number 800-780-2673, extension 4453. Let's get back to the show. All right, and we're back from break here. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome our first guest to the show who's going to expound on a lot of the things I just talked about in terms of your banking and somebody who's going to shed not just some insight but brings a lot of experience. This is, uh, uh, at this moment, want to welcome Glenn Gray to the show. He's got more than 36 years of experience in the financial services industry and joined South County Bank as president and CEO in July of 2012. Currently as CEO, uh, Glenn manages all aspects of the bank and serves as a member of the board of directors. South County Bank provides banking services to the small and middle market businesses throughout Southern California. Uh, Glenn and his wife, Catherine, are residents of Laguna since 2000, so they're right here local. And their sons, Michael and Nicholas, are bro both serving active duty in the U.S. Army and Special Forces, uh, which in talking to Glenn, uh, a lot of interesting stories there. He's also on the board of the Laguna Beach Playhouse, involved in fundraising and awareness for the Mission Hospital in Laguna Beach, as well as the Susan G. Komen uh, in Orange County. Uh, I want to welcome Glenn to the show. Glenn, how are you this morning? Great. Thank you very much. Excellent. I want to start... Uh, a little bit uh, at 30,000 feet altitude here, and, and just begin with your career path. Can you share with listeners how you rose to the position you are in today? Sure. Well, a little bit of luck along the way. 
I actually uh, grew up in a small town in Illinois and uh, got a job as a bank teller uh, in the summer between my junior or sophomore junior year of high school. And that was sort of the hook into banking. I stayed there for four years through the last two years of high school and junior college. That gave me enough funds to go on to school. And then upon graduation, uh, the university had a pretty good uh, outplacement office, uh, interviewed with a number of different companies, and I received a, an offer from Burroughs, which was a big company that uh, focused on selling computers and terminals to banks. So with that little bit of experience I had as a banker, as a teller, I got a job selling computers to banks. Um, so I, uh, I took that job. It was great, uh, um, although it did put me back in the Midwest, which wasn't part of the dream. Uh, the dream at that point was to move to California, and I kept applying for a transfer, but I was pretty low on that long list of people who wanted to transfer. So I saved up my commissions and uh, left that job and moved to California. And um, through a recruiter, ended up working for a commercial finance company. So that was kind of the hook into lending. It was lending to companies that were kind of marginally bankable or not bankable. From there, to make a long story somewhat shorter, moved into mainstream banking, corporate banking, uh, and then eventually here to uh, more of community banking. Fantastic. Now, in our conversation in the past, you mentioned you started targeting at-risk banks, kind of like the ones I talked about earlier in the show, and really looking to transform them, bring them back to solvency. Can you share with listeners what, what is the definition of an at-risk bank? Well, the easiest definition is one that's under a um, consent order from the regulatory agencies, um, or what some may f uh, more commonly be familiar with a cease and desist, but now it's called a consent order. <clears throat> the regulatory agencies, be it the, uh, the state or the OCC, will place that on a bank, and there will be articles, which is just the list of things that the bank, bank must fix. And you can have access to that information, so it's pretty easy to see what the issues are. Now, if you don't have access to that or a, a consent order hasn't been issued yet, um, you can look at publicly available information in terms of their, what's commonly called it a Texas ratio, which is a ratio that zeroes in on the amount of problem loans. And then clearly just looking at its profitability or lack thereof. So you, know, you start to get a precursor when you look at their P&L, the ratios, and then ultimately, if there's a consent order, you see exactly what the regulators are, are talking about. That makes sense. Now, back in 2007 through 2009, we, we saw the run on banks and the issues that came up as a result of the mortgage crisis. You saw all this. What were your initial thoughts back then? And then, you know, as the dust started to settle, what did you glean from those experiences to really say, this is what I wanted to do with the bank right. to make sure it was solvent again? Well, the first thing that I noticed was really more in 2006 and some of the, into 2007, was some of the signs that just weren't being paid attention to. Um, just over lending, especially into the housing sector, lending in, in speculative construction. Um, and so fortunately, the bank I was at, uh, we ceased that type of lending in 2006, the first quarter, which I think had a, a a meaningful impact, positive impact on us so that we avoided that, that problem. Now more to your point, as, as we got into 2007, 2008, started to look at those banks that didn't make that change, kept lending uh, into speculative construction, and, and that was not the only area. Um, you certainly had the mortgage lending, you had some very over robust lending with the use of SBA loans. So. Uh, we looked at a number of banks that were failing or, or that the FDIC had asked us to come in and assist with. Uh, and these are community banks, you know, smaller banks in our footprint. And if I had to summarize what were the, the, the common themes, it was over lending in con speculative construction and SBA and mortgage lending. Those three factors really started to uh, take the banks down. So lessons learned from those three sectors, you know, what to do, what not to do. You know, you bring up a great point, which a lot of people don't talk about. The other loans that were being aggressively marketed back then, besides the mortgages, which contributed to a lot of our issues. Now, the change leadership, as I know, here at the bank has been really remarkable. We're actually sitting in the beautiful conference room here of South County Bank doing this interview live. 
as you came in, besides just the financial stuff, what were some of the leadership objectives you had in mind besides just, you know, in, in repairing this thing? Sure. It's all about the people. I mean, when you think about banking, it's a competitive industry and it's difficult to differentiate yourself, especially if you're a smaller bank. You know, the big banks um, have ways of doing that a little bit more effectively, but the smaller community banks typically compete with the abilities of their people. So that was one of the, the, the more interesting aspects once I got in here to figure out what was holding this bank together. There was some, some, some feature that you, know, you don't pick off of a call report or off of the numbers. And what I came to realize, it was the, the combination of the loyal employees and the, and the loyal clients that didn't walk away from this bank when many would have. Um, so one of my objectives, besides understanding the depths and, of, of the asset problem, the loan problems, and developing strategies to fix that, was what did we have in terms of personnel, what didn't we have, and how to fill those holes. You know, on the road to financial solvency, your bank, uh, as you told me in a, in a separate conversation, started to face heavy audits and <laughs> regulatory visits, which is good for the consumer, obviously. But tell us about what the purpose of those audits were and how in-depth they were and where you are today. Right. Well, the public should take some comfort in, in, in the regulatory environment. I know the regulators get a lot of bad press, but they actually uh, serve an important function. And... In this case, this is a bank that was under one of those consent orders. We had 12 different or, uh, articles, which was essentially fix everything under the sun. Um, not just assets, but loans and processes and so forth. Uh, so the regulators had a lot to look at. And as a result of that, they were here uh, every six months for about three weeks at a time, followed by a lot of follow-up uh, and then follow-up meetings to uh, go over their findings. And about the time you're getting that last report, you're gearing up for their next visit. So it almost seemed like a, an endless cycle. Wow. Well, uh, now looking at where you are today and some of the metrics that you've seen in terms of positive growth and, and, and action, what are the keys to giving security to your customers moving forward and making sure that this type of success persists? Well, that, that's a very timely question because we, we just had it come up yesterday. We're, we're out in a much more positive um, new business mode right now. And we're calling on a client literally tomorrow who, in preparation for that call, wanted to see our financial statements because he had heard things, and that's fair. You know, he, he knew that at one point in time we weren't in good condition. So that's a good example of what we're doing is sharing our financial results with our clients or prospective clients so that they have an appreciation that we are now well capitalized. Uh, we have uh, excess loan loss reserves. Uh, we're profitable and the quality of our assets is pristine. You know, that clarity goes such a long way. In fact, I find in most of the interactions I have that people just, all they want is that clarity sometimes, which is great. What's been your proudest moment in this run? in this transformation uh, at the, you know, this formerly at-risk bank to where it is today? Wow. Um, well, you'd think maybe it, the answer to that would be the day we closed the recapitalization. I mean, and don't get me wrong, that, that was a proud moment. Um, and it was a couple of years longer in coming than what I had uh, wanted. But at the end of 2015, we did raise $14 million, and that was the last big significant hurdle to re getting out of that consent order. But really the proudest moment came um, somewhat after that when as a result of the recap, I received calls from people that I had known in the industry, other bankers, who now wanted to come to work for us. Wow. So to me, that was a, that was a sign that we had made it. That's great. Well, Glenn, I appreciate the stories you've shared today from bank teller to CEO of a successful bank. It's quite a story and the insight you shared about your thought processes, especially after what happened in the, uh, the late 2000s, I think is something our listeners will find very valuable. What's the best way to get a hold of you in the bank and, and uh, inquire about what you all do? Sure. Well, um, this is kind of fun because 
I say this oftentimes when I'm out on a call with a prospective client. Uh, here's my direct line, 949-766-3088, mm -hmm. um, and I challenge you to get the direct line of any other bank CEO. <laughs> that is, I'm surprised that uh, you gave it my you, you gave it myself. So uh, that's the phone number. In fact, also the website will be on the Give More to Get More tab of our website, as all show guests are. So anytime you guys want to see what South County Bank is all about, you can reference that page. Uh, Glenn, I want to thank you so much for your time this morning. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Let's take a quick break. When we get back, we'll do our Give More to Get More segment. You're listening to the Financial Wake Up Show with Dan and Troy, KCAA, 1050 AM and 106.5 FM. I want to talk for a quick second about a unique internship program. I think a great internship program gives you a chance to make a name for yourself while picking up specialized skills that can launch your career. And if you can do that in a niche industry with a high level of importance that impacts how businesses operate, well then that's a win-win-win scenario. So I'm going to talk to you about Core Support Systems, a company that has an internship program for you listeners who want to get a foot in the door of a very important industry. For over 20 years, Core Support Systems has provided equipment for what are called mission-critical environments. They handle power requirements in case the power goes out. In fact, I'm learning we take power for granted. We need it for everything, and we don't realize the, the crucial issues that happen if power goes out. So think about it. Who uses this? Hospitals. You can't have power go out during surgeries. How about computer server farms, these huge warehouses? You can't have power going out uh, or the Internet shuts down. This is big, big stuff we rely on. And Core Support Systems delivers uninterruptible power supplies to these huge operations that need this in case of any mission critical or outage situation. They also do centralized emergency lighting. They do design and assessment of your power distribution needs. They do precision cooling for all your businesses as well. They install and support these systems. I know the owners there, Hector and Irene, they are fantastic. They have a great team and have built an unbelievable business. They are looking for a business development intern who will help secure contracts for key accounts. You'll be expected to learn about product and service offerings, which will add to your ability to increase sales revenues and your personal business income. Core Support Systems is moving forward to a virtual office, so you're going to be primarily working from home. And how can you beat that? Uh, occasionally, you'll have to go to the corporate office. But you do need a high level of computer literacy, especially with uh, Word, Excel, and PowerPoint being some of the key softwares you need to know. Uh, but if you're goal-oriented, customer-oriented, you're reliable, you've got a positive attitude, a great attendance record, and you're a team player, take a look at the internship being offered at Core Support Systems. It's a great opportunity to launch your career within a niche market and have some fantastic upside potential. For inquiries, email ialvarado at coresupportsys.com. That's ialvarado at coresupportsys.com, or you can call them toll-free, 800-780-2673, extension 4453. Again, the number 800-780-2673, extension 4453. Let's get back to the show. Okay, and welcome back to the show. Um, every week, I highlight a charity, a nonprofit to end the show. And why is that? Because I truly don't think you can get more in life without getting more. So on this week's Give More to Get More segment, I'm going to welcome, welcome Doug Riffenberg with Save the Children. And to give you some background on Doug before we get into the great work he's doing with Save the Children, uh, he's a business builder, a leader of people, and has developed success by preserving a balance between delivering on a mission while remaining faithful to the core principles that drive healthy, strong businesses. He's developed these qualities throughout his career in corporate and nonprofit spaces, working for three world-class organizations, IBM, Xerox, and now Save the Children. Uh, Doug was hired by Save the Children to leverage his business development expertise uh, to raise public funding for Save the Children's U.S. programs, he shifted his role to the California uh, LEAD program, and uh, as a state director here in, this, in, in California, he's since been elevated 
to Senior Director of National Field Programs across the entire U.S. for the, the organization. He oversees program operations across uh, the entire portfolio of states with an emphasis on program quality, revenue generation, and advancing policy change. Doug, it's so nice to have you join us this Memorial Day weekend morning. How are you today? I'm doing great, Daniel. Thank you for having me on your show. It's a real honor to be here today. Well, we're excited to have you as well, and, and I'll get right into it. Tell us, uh, the listeners, uh, what is the mission of Save the Children? What does your organization stand for? Yeah, well, Save the Children's major focus uh, here in the U.S. and around the world is, uh, is to give children really three things, a healthy start, the opportunity to learn, and uh, protection from harm. And because we believe that every child deserves a future, it's really our mission to invest in childhood uh, every day in times of crisis and for our future. And uh, some very, very important uh, causes there in that brief mission you gave on the organization. Give us a little background on the history of Save the Children and, and how you've arrived to where you are today. school children in Kentucky during the uh, Great Depression and really supporting those kids with basic needs. Excuse me, um, Doug. Doug, I'm sorry. We, we lost you there for about 10 seconds when you started the answers to that question. Uh, Carlos did not pick that up. So uh, can you start again with uh, the history of the organization and we'll edit the uh, sound from there. Go ahead. Sure. Save the Children's work in the in the United States really began in 1932 and during the Great Depression um, we were supporting school children in Kentucky with basic needs and uh, it's really been our commitment to, re to reach every last child and, and that's really evidenced by our work in, in rural America. Um, our U.S. programs now uh, is focused on early education, health, and literacy and ultimately our goal is to help kids here in the U.S. Uh, succeed in school and in life and we really believe that if, uh, if children can't read and participate uh, in, in school then, then they have a bleak future and, and the science and, and research really demonstrates that. Um, here in the U.S. Uh, we're really focused on rural and remote communities and uh, sometimes, uh, actually quite often, we're the only nonprofit supporting children and families in some of these uh, very unserved communities across the United States. Um, and we offer our programs in 16 states, uh, including some very poor communities right here in California. You know, and California is a, a beautiful state, but we have some some real vast regions of high poverty here in California. Uh, I think we're all uh, had opportunities to drive up the 101 and the 5 and the 99, but sometimes we don't realize that these vast regions of, of geography also have uh, vast areas of poverty. And uh, just, to, just to take our Central Valley as an example, if the Central Valley were a state which uh, is about the size of Tennessee, it would be the 12th most populous state in the nation and the poorest in the nation, uh, poorer than uh, Louisiana or Mississippi. So, uh, pretty shocking statistics. That, that is uh, very shocking. The, the number there to be the 12th largest in population is, is a tremendous amount of support that's going out to them. And I don't think we realize that as listeners. And the fact that you started in, during the Great Depression and in the first segment of the day, that's a good time because I talked about some of the events that happened around then and the struggles and to see that the organization is thriving today. You mentioned, uh, Doug, education and success for these children in rural areas uh, for the majority. What are some of the programs that are provided and who, who are they targeting specifically? Sure. Uh, well... We're, first of all, we're reaching our youngest kids and uh, families with our early child development opportunities, and and that includes a uh, signature program called Early Steps to School Success. That's a literacy-based home visiting program. 
program, and we actually have uh, staff going to the homes and checking in with families and and uh, talking about the development of their child, teaching them how to read to their kids, uh, even if they can't read, uh, sharing books with their children, uh, and those sorts of things, and and really building the confidence of, of parents in uh, in raising their children and and becoming advocates for their children's education. And then we also have Head Start, where kids living in poverty are are really afforded an even playing field, uh, and that increases their access to uh, uh, essential learning skills that prepares them for school. Uh, another thing we do is um, is we also provide children early learning opportunities in our school age uh, programs, which are literacy programs, and these help uh, the children grow as readers. And then we also kind of append that with the Healthy Choices program, which is uh, which is really all about nutritional education. It increases their access to um, uh, physical activities and, and offers them a healthy snack. And and then finally, as an organization experienced in, in responding to crisis, uh, we help families prepare and communities prepare for emergencies. And uh, in California, we're serving uh, a little more than 8,300 kids across the state and uh, in 23 communities and in four counties, including um, locally here in Southern California, Los Angeles County, and San Bernardino County. That's tremendous. 8,300 children getting visits, consultations, and I love the programs, especially around the tr nutrition. I happen to know uh, on past guests that uh, nutrition for children continues to be an issue in our country, and I think it's great that uh, Save the Children is engaged there. What areas do you all need help? How do our listeners get involved uh, through programs you offer? Um, it's a great question. It's been, uh, I, I got to start by saying it's shocking to know that, uh, that today one in five children in the U.S. are, are, are still growing up in poverty. Um, uh, and they're really at risk of falling behind in the early years, struggling in school and dropping out, and really never reaching their full potential. And, and in California, we, we actually use the California Poverty Measure, and that takes into consideration the, the higher cost of living here. In, in, in this state, uh, with that measure, one in four children are living in poverty. Um, so we at Save the Children do want to do more, and we're really making sure uh, and working hard that every last child has a chance to succeed um, and, and really reach their full potential. And through the generous support of our donors, um, we can make that happen. And I would encourage your listeners to go to savethechildren.org US uh, to learn more about how we're helping these vulnerable kids um, and how to support U.S. programs. That's fantastic. Uh, does the website, uh, I'm assuming, have some links as far as any volunteerism that you're looking for as well? Uh, we, we have some challenges with volunteerism because we're doing direct services with children and we need to uh, uh, background check uh, our, our volunteers. It's pretty rigorous as sure. an organization that's very, very focused on child protection. We're very cautious about engaging, not to say that we don't have volunteers, but um, engaging volunteers in, in rural and remote areas is very difficult. Mm -hmm. um, I will, however, say that if if listeners are interested in supporting our U.S. programs, uh, they can also choose to sponsor a child uh, living in poverty in the U.S. and uh, that directly benefits uh, a sponsored child in the surrounding community. So, um, basically, uh, that's a that's a monthly donation and, and through written correspondence with their sponsored child, they can uh, personally witness the positive change they're making with those kids. Well, I'm glad that there's a, a, an emphasis on vetting, uh, which I think is very critical for those children. And, you know, we talk about sponsoring children overseas so many times, and, and here we are in the United States in our own backyard, and we have children that need support here as well. I know you're launching a global campaign uh, called uh, around International Children's Day, which is June 1st. Can you tell our listeners about uh, the global campaign that you, you are supporting? Sure. Uh, yeah, that's very 
very exciting, and, and we are approaching International Children's Day, which is June 1st, and um, we say the children, we're, we're really shining a spotlight on the number of children in the U.S. and around the world who are missing out on, on the opportunity to have a full childhood uh, for many reasons, including violence, uh, might be health issues, uh, teen pregnancy, uh, and others as well, of course. Um, so I want to encourage your listeners to go to end of uh, let me see endofchildhood.org. Um, I will say that site doesn't launch until 5 p.m. on May 31st, but uh, your listeners can go there to learn more about um, where childhood is most threatened and also where childhood is least threatened in the United States and around the world. Um, and so we're calling on U.S. leaders. We're also calling on global leaders uh, to really make sure that children aren't deprived of their childhood. And this is a, a great place to learn about that. Great. What was Again, that website? The website is endofchildhood.org. I see. Okay. And by the way, listeners, as a reminder, all of their information will be on our Give More to Get More tab on the website as soon as the show is over. Last question before I let you go, Doug. What, what's been the most rewarding aspect of your leadership and involvement with Save the Children? Well, uh, I think what inspires me the most is to see children uh, that are disengaged from learning emerge from our programs with a love for reading and, and really a confidence in reading and in engaging uh, with other students and uh, in their classroom. Um, uh, that is that engagement, that confidence is actually very, very crucial to their success. And I actually have a, um, there's a story about a young boy who attended our programs for a number of years and uh, his, his mother, this is actually out in San Bernardino, his mother was incarcerated and his illiterate father uh, was working really hard to support uh, this boy and his four brothers and sisters as a single dad. And I took him up to Sacramento to read a poem to a rural summit that we had up there. It was an educational summit. And at the airport, he asked if I would buy him something. And, and uh, considering that I have children, I didn't think that was very um, unusual at all. But then he looked at me and he said, will you buy me a book? And of course, I was ecstatic, we ran over to the uh, to the little bookstore there in the airport, and uh, he chose the Diary of a Wimpy Kid, and he read the he read the book all the way uh, on the trip uh, on the airplane up to Sacramento, all during the summit, and he actually fell asleep uh, on the pages of the book on the airplane on the way back. So um, he was really a, just a great example of what can happen when a child falls in love with reading. Uh, he's just very articulate and confident, and, and my understanding is he's doing really, really well in school. Uh, and then finally, I just say that uh, yeah, I'm really inspired by the, the parents and grandparents. It's, it's not just about the kids. It's become very clear to me, uh, in my experience serving children and families here in the U.S., that all parents really want the best for their children. And we see these parents and grandparents becoming empowered by the knowledge they receive uh, through our programs and uh, very inspiring to see them step up, take ownership of their kids' success and, uh, and really sometimes becoming leaders in their community and returning that knowledge to, uh, to other members in the community as well. And that's really what we want to do is to build, build knowledge and capacity in these communities uh, you know, the money's not always there, and uh, uh, grants come and go, and, and when we have to leave uh, a community or an area, we'd like to see that that, that knowledge and those skills um, have increased and are circulated in that community. Those are some uh, very touching stories about, you know, the power of what, what can happen when you uh, inspire a child, and a great way to start our weekend uh, Doug, I want to thank you so much for joining us this morning and bringing uh, some light to what your organization is doing. Obviously, very important work for a large population here in California. I hope you enjoy the rest of your holiday weekend, and uh, thank you here at the Financial Wake Up Show. Great. Thank you for having me, and uh, I hope your listeners all have a great three-day weekend as well. Thank you, Doug. All right. Another great episode in the books. Some uh, great insight from our two guests 
I want to wish you a very happy and safe three-day Memorial Day weekend. Uh, and until next Saturday, I wish you health, wealth, and prosperity. If you have any doubt, just reach out. Daniel at FinancialWakeUpShow.com. You've been listening here on KCAA Radio, the station that leaves no listener behind. Have a good one, folks.